know why I'm getting up. <laughs> that was awesome. That was awesome. I want to welcome you, especially if you're a guest or visitor with us for the first time. We are glad you're here at Fellowship. Uh, Fellowship is a great uh, church. It's family oriented. You can see that. And we just love sharing testimonies about what God is doing. And today we are entering into um, something that, like it says on the screen here, we want you to join this conversation with us. So for the months of August and September, and then sliding in today, this Sunday as well, we're starting a series called Table Talk. And it's more than a series for us. It's more than just uh, uh, an understanding of a fresh, uh, you know, uh, renewal on our vision. It, it's, it's a way for us to understand what the church is about as the family of God. And uh, what it looks like to have a whole family that includes all of your family units in it, in a very broken world. Right? And, and we want to know what the value of that is. And, and we want you to be able to be able to take home what you what you learn here, whether it's midweek or on Sunday, and then bring it back and allow us just together to be the family of God. And so we're going to look into what it looks like to have conversations around the table at home, what it looks like to have conversations together through prayer and, and around a dinner table on Wednesday nights here at the church as well. And we want to invite you into all of that. But uh, today, as we start, I just wonder, uh, as, as, and today is, is kind of kicking this off in a, kind of like a soft launch way. And we're going to look through um, the book of Nehemiah and, and, and work through some of the principles that, that helped him build and rebuild the wall and, and, and really the people um, in, in that moment and some of those building principles that we see in there, how he laid a firm foundation. And so today I just want to talk to you about the critical first step that Nehemiah took when it, when it came to this. You ever had a project in your life that, that was a, a challenge given where, where you looked at it and you knew, okay, I know it has to be done. I just don't know where to start. <laughs> Uh, I, I have no idea. It could be something, a cleanup project at home, that one room that you threw everything in for like five or ten years, and now you're finally going to get to it, right? Or maybe it's that honeydew list project that you've been putting off. In any case, it always feels like you don't know where to begin, right? My dad always told me when I, I would call him every once in a while when I was in college, Dad, I'm overwhelmed. Of course, I had procrastinated on a paper, and you've heard this, me tell this story, and he'd say, Take the first step and just write your name at the top of the paper, right? Sometimes you just have to figure out where to begin. In any case, it always feels like you don't know where to start. For me, it was my, uh, uh, this, really this basement project in Kansas before we moved here. And when we moved in, this was what our basement looked like. It was a beautiful house, but the basement obviously looked like this. It had this one weird room. So you walk down those stairs you see on the bottom left, and then the room that you see on the right there, that was like dead center. And it was just weird, odd room that they had built. And so uh, we, we utilized that one wall. You can go, there's a couple other pictures coming up through here. And we began to re, you know, repurpose this basement so that you know, I, we could have a place for the guys' Bible study I was doing college ministry at the time uh, could meet. And I, you know, of course, my wife had a place to send me when I got grumpy. Of course, you know, that, was, that was kind of the purpose, right? And so I began to rebuild this room and it was a huge overhaul from floor to ceiling. I did, I did everything that I could and got help when I needed to. And sometimes I'd look at it and wonder, how in the world is this thing going to get finished? I, I think that's how we as Christians sometimes feel in the church when we approach evangelism and, 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 and church growth for the kingdom, not just in the kingdom, but for the kingdom. We look at it and don't know where to start, what our plan's going to be. We know the objective, right, is the Great Commission to... You know, to, to go into all the world and, and, and preach the good news and baptize people. We know all of those things, but how do we accomplish it? And Nehemiah, he was faced with a project. He had a challenge before him that left him in a situation where he felt he had to do something about it. He couldn't, he couldn't just not go there. <laughs> now you see me, uh, you know, getting the, the room ready there. We can just pass all those pictures. That's okay. We don't, need to, we don't need to keep going there. But the room ended up very very nice and it was something that I was very proud of when we finished it up. But I believe how Nehemiah dealt with the challenge that he had will teach us how to build the kingdom together and where we need to start. And I feel like God has given us a lot of a lot of great insights here. So are, are you at least a little bit intrigued about what Nehemiah did? Okay, let's get started here. I want you to see the context. In chapter 1 verse 1 we see a lot of different things. It says, the words of Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah, in the month of 
Kislev, which you don't need to know that, in the 20th year while I was in the cit citadel of Susa. So we get a lot, a lot of things going on there, a lot of names you don't know and probably don't know how to pronounce, but King Artaxerxes was the king of the time. The people of, the people of Israel have been uh, exiled to Babylon, and King Artaxerxes is facing repeated revolts and, and mutinies and rebellions, especially in the area of, of, of Judah and around Judah. And that turmoil pointed to a very strategic importance for Judah and, and really kind of for, for the king, kind of a political expediency. It was a strategic area where he needed to have friendly stability, if you will. He needed to know that there, those people were with him. And, and so Nehemiah's mission to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem and, and his authority should be seen in that setting. God went before him and gave him favor because the king, unbeknownst to him, was looking for, was looking for a strategic political stability and friends. And so he began to partner with Nehemiah. And, and this is where we have to look at this in the context. The Jews, though... The overall Jewish people, even though they're in exile, they, they, their assumption was that no one could touch them, right? Uh, on their greatest hits list is, is MC Hammer, right? You can't touch this. They thought that that was them. And, and so their world was upside down now that they were in exile. And they were imprinted in their minds with the results of a huge defeat and this exile that had happened for all their people and the destruction of their city, the holy city, Jerusalem. And it was a common practice in that time when you overtook a, a, a nation, another nation, that you would separate for yourself all of the, the leaders, the cream of the crop, if you will, the civil and religious leaders of a defeated country, and leave the poorer classes there. So they took all of the leaders and brought them into Babylon, which is where you see Nehemiah beginning this for us. And all of the other people were left in the city because they had no one, nothing else to do but just to succumb to whatever Babylon told them. And this was kind of a, 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 a thing where the king used in his government all of these leaders. And so the future of the nation of Israel wasn't actually in Judah. It wasn't in Israel. It was in Babylon. All of the leaders and all of the future leaders coming up a great distance away from actual Jerusalem. Those exiled, some of them had good experiences. Some of them were tormented and had really bad experiences in Babylon. But Nehemiah, he was the cream of the crop, and he had a really great experience as, as being exiled goes. And, and his heart, though, was stirred for his people in his holy city, Jerusalem. And, and the catalyst for him was a report from his brother. If you'd look with me, you read this, and if we continue on in verse 2, Hananiah Hanani, excuse me, one of my brothers came from Judah with some other men, and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile and also about Jerusalem. They said to me, those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. That, that news from his brother was the catalyst in his life. He, he had a desire to know what was going on there. He didn't want to forget his roots. He didn't want to forget his home city and his nation. So he asked about them. And as he got this report, it, it, it did something inside of him. And if you're taking notes with me, the first thing you need to, to hear here is that we, in, in terms of a catalyst, like Nehemiah, need an honest evaluation of reality. When it comes to what, what we're, what we're, what's around us today, sometimes we can kind of sleepwalk through some of these things or fearfully step back and we don't realize how disconnected we've become, not only to, to church and the life of the body of Christ, but also to the greater, greater world around us and what's really happening. And this news that Nehemiah got was kind of a wake-up call for him in this moment. He found out that the people were in bad shape, right? They were troubled and disgraced. They, 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 were, they were constantly uh, under the thumb of someone, and they were disgraced as a people. They had no pride in who they were, and he says the city was even worse than that. Because when you don't have the walls, you don't have security. You don't have, you don't have a sense of, of pride in that moment. 
Nehemiah, upon hearing the news of this beloved city in ruins and the people in humiliating shame, came to a point of critical mass. Critical mass is, a, is a, I think, a, a great thought here. It, 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 it means this, an amount or level needed for a specific result or new action to occur. He had it up to here with hearing that news, in other words. It affected him so much, it was just the right amount, that news was, for him to, to, to begin a new action in his life, or an amount of necessary or sufficient amount necessary sufficient to have a significant effect or to achieve a, a, a result. God used that news in his life to bring him to a point of saying, I got to do something about this. You can also see critical mass used in sustainability. And we're going to see that later on in, in, in his leadership. But it also can mean the minimum amount of money or number of people required to start or sustain an operation or business or process. And he worked a process. He had a vision and he worked the process of rebuilding this wall. And, and he, he got to a point, in other words, where he heard enough of the bad news that he had to do something about it. Do you, do you find yourself in a place right now in our current society and world where you feel like maybe you've had enough? You don't know what to do. You're hearing all these things. Sometimes it's connected to you. Sometimes it's not. But if you come to a critical mass point in your life where you need to do something about it. It was Martin Luther King Jr. that came to a critical mass of his own more than 50 years ago. He was given a healthy, honest dose of reality, saw the conditions of the society crumbling down around him, and he knew that he had to do something. And he said this, the ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands in moments of comfort and convenience, but where he stands at times of challenge and controversy. The true neighbor will risk his position, his prestige, and even his life for the welfare of others. This isn't quoted on the screen, but he went on to say and in the letter from Birmingham jail, we will have to repent in this generation, not merely for the hateful words and actions of the bad people, but for the appalling silence of the good people. You remember him saying that? And so then later on in June of that same year, he says, if a man hasn't discovered something he will die for, he isn't fit to live. Wasn't saying, I don't think he was devaluing you as a person, but he was saying, you really, if you don't have something where, you know, where, you've, where you've reached critical mass and you understand the importance of the situation and you have to do something about it and you would, you would even risk your life for it, then really, what is your life? How are you even living it? Like anything of significance, there's a cost. And, and the cost for Nehemiah was a broken heart. See, God broke Nehemiah's heart for what was breaking his own heart. If you go on to that next slide, that's the next point is the cost. The cost for Nehemiah was that God broke his heart for what was breaking God's heart. Look at verse 4. He says, When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Mourned and fasted and prayed. He, he, in other words, mourned like he lost a loved one. He mourned like he had lost a loved one. It hit him so hard. The honest overflow, the honest response and reaction in that moment was mourning like someone had died in his life. Now, now, now take that, and, and, and I know this will be forever imprinted in your head, but Elvis also sang about, about heartbreak. You guys remember that? <laughs> well, since my baby left me, I found a new place to dwell. It's down at the end of Lonely Street at Heartbreak Hotel, right? These, these are great verses, by the way. And although it's always crowded, you still can find some room. <laughs> There's always room in Heartbreak, right, where people... Well, broken-hearted lovers do cry away their gloom. Well, the bellhop's tears keep flowing. <laughs> if you ever need a good song, right, when you're sad, right? And the desk clerks dressed in black. Well, they've, they've been so long on Lonely Street, they ain't never going to look back. Brokenness, though, is an appropriate response to sin and its effects. Nehemiah heard a report the catalyst to, to, to this moment for him, realized that it was all the result of the sin of his people. 
He recognized why all of these ha- things happened. What they had done wrong before God. Have you ever been truly broken because of your own sin? But have you ever truly been crushed by the weight of that sin? Have you seen the vile and utterly corrupt nature of what sin really is? And how it affects other people, not just yourself. Have you ever really wept and grieved bitterly for this sin that the sinless, spotless Lamb of God died for? And He consumed that that infinite weight of the wrath of a living, holy God upon Himself for you and for me. Have you ever felt the weight of, of a little bit of that sin? Just your own personal part of that. When was the last time your heart was broken for those around you or your own personal sin? That could be your critical mass moment. That could be the catalyst just to think about. See, we always want to blame someone else today, don't we? We always want to make it the other political party's fault or this other leader's fault or, you know... We always want to cast blame somewhere else. Have you ever looked at your own heart and felt the weight of your own decisions? The report, the catalyst that Nehemiah heard helped him realize the condition of his own people. It wasn't just broken walls and gates and disgraced people he was broken for. Those were just the symptoms of a real problem going on. You ever looked around and felt just the weight of things going on around you and you realize, man, there's actually something deeper going on here. That's where he found himself. The people had sinned against God and he was just as much a part of that as anyone else and his heart was broken before God. An older worship song out there has this to say, I see a generation rising up to take their place with selfless faith. I see a new revival stirring as we pray and seek. We're on our knees. Then the bridge says, heal my heart and make it clean. Open up my eyes to the things unseen. Show me how to love like you have loved me. That comes from a place of brokenness, doesn't it? And then he says this, break my heart for what breaks yours. Everything I am for your kingdom's cause as I walk from earth into it. So from now until you come back and we enter into eternity, would you continue to break my heart for the things that break yours, God? The cost of building the kingdom comes in many different forms, but the first is to allow God to break our hearts for what breaks his. Nehemiah didn't stop there, though. He knew he needed to take another step into the situation, and this one was the most critical step. The critical first step is that he prayed to the one who could change their circumstances. Right? He didn't just mourn. He didn't just fast. He prayed to the only one who could change their circumstances. The first thing he did in verse 5 that we say is he invoked and praised God. He says, he says Then I said, Lord, after he spent this time, understand, this is slow down spirituality at, at its core. When, when you see an issue, you don't just rush to solve the problem. You don't just, you don't just gloss over it and keep going. When, when God begins to break your heart, you sit with that for a while. You let it be absorbed into you so that you can hear God and His way of what, how He wants to resolve it. If you don't slow down enough to listen... You'll never hear how God wants to use you in his solution. But it says, then, after he had fasted and mourned and prayed, he said, Lord, the God of heaven, the great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commandments. He's reminding himself of who God is. And in his address, he captures both the transcendence of God, the otherworldliness of God, and also the eminence of God and how he is with us through the Holy Spirit. And that's what he says, O oh Lord, God of heaven, the great and awesome God. He praised him in this moment. He knew who his God was. The true God is not only, not only far above his people as the God of heaven, but he is near his people as a God of a covenant. And he's made that covenant with us. Deuteronomy 4, 7 says, For what great nation has a God as near to them as the Lord our God is near to us whenever we call on Him? 
And you're reminded of how near God is when you call on Him. And so Nehemiah in this moment calls upon the Lord. And he doesn't just invoke Him and praise Him. He also confesses and repents in this moment. He humbly takes responsibility for his people's sin. So many of us are against public confession and repentance. Because that wasn't my thing. I didn't do that to those people. I didn't say that to that person. I didn't hurt that person. Sometimes we need to look at our nation and our society, even our church as a whole, and begin to repent for our people's sin, not just our own personal sin. When sinful humanity is confronted by a holy God, the only authentic reaction is this idea of prostration and confession that we see in Isaiah, that we see in Revelation. Repenting tears, Thomas Watson says, are precious. God puts them in his bottle. Repenting tears are beautifying. To God, a tear in the eye adorns more than a ring on the finger. Repenting tears are comforting. And he says repentance may be compared to myrrh. I love this idea of what repentance really does and is for us. Myrrh is thought of as bitter to the taste, but comforting to the spirit. And so repentance may be bitter to our flesh, but it is most refreshing to our soul. Let us give Christ the water of our tears, and he will give us the wine of his blood. He didn't just do that confess and repent he also interceded he didn't just humbly take responsibility and confess those sins he began then to implore the god of heaven the great and awesome god reminding him of his own promises he says in verse 8 through 11 remember the instruction you gave your servant moses saying if you are unfaithful i will scatter you among the nations he he's rehearsing what god had had warned them with and encouraged them not to do but if you return to me he says he remembers this as well and obey my commands then even your exiled people are at the farthest horizon i will gather them from there and bring them to the place i have chosen as a dwelling for my name they are your servants, he says, and your people, whom you redeemed by your great strength and your mighty hand. This is, this is Nehemiah. This is one of the first things he does when he hears this news. Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this, your servant, and to the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. Give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man. Why? Because he says, I'm the cupbearer to the king. He's about to do something after being heartbroken for the thing that was breaking God's heart. But first, he, he was reminded of God's promises. And if we don't have his promises, what hope do we have? Then he reminded him of his people. These reminders from Nehemiah were more for him than for God to remember. He needed to remember what God was going to remind him of. But when God hears any man or woman calling on him in intercession for another, like Moses, he, he even talks about Moses, with the motivation of salvation or restoration, he will listen and hear us. God is never more near us, imminent, than when we are confessing and interceding on behalf of those. So the critical first step was not hearing the report or allowing his heart to be broken, but it was actually taking it to the Lord. That was the critical first step. He heard it, God showed him, God broke him, and then he took it to him and said, God, I know who you are. I know the promises that you gave us. We, we are experiencing the consequences and effects of bad choices. But today we know that if we just come back to you, you will restore your people. That's what we must do in order to get back into the game post-COVID stuff here in Spring Hill. We need to begin to ask God to do some things for us. We need an honest report, an honest evaluation. There are a lot of distracted, disconnected people right now that need the family of God. That's what we're going to talk about in this Table Talk series that need the body of Christ to be, uh, to, to be distinct, and in that distinction, to be attractive to the world, a new alternative that's from, from the ancient of days, right? But something that is brand new to the people's hearts that will refresh their souls. We need to hear that honest report. We need God to break our hearts, 
And we must take that critical first step and bring it to the one true God who can make a difference. And lastly, and this is our take home today. This is how we take it home. We need to pray that God will first show us. Right? We need an honest evaluation. In your prayer time this week, as you pray and you think about Nehemiah and you think about what we're walking into in this new year, I just want you to think about just, God, would you give me an honest evaluation of not just the world around me? I think I got that. <laughs> Maybe my own heart, my own personal walk. You heard these kids of how God revived their souls. The rededication to, to surrender to God and to faithfully following Him. We need Him to show us an honest evaluation. And then number two, we need Him to break us. When's the last time your heart was broken for the people around you or your own personal sin. And then lastly, I, I pray that God would call you. Pray to him and ask him to call you into this. Call you into the game. G give you a critical mass moment where it's a catalyst in your life and you, you just say, there, there's, I have to do something about this. So again, that question comes up. When was the last time your heart was broken for those around you or by your own personal sin. Because here's the thing, and we'll end with this as the worship team comes up. God has to do something in us before he can do something through us. Do you believe that, church? Amen. Nehemiah knew that if I don't take this to God and sit with this for a while, this news... No matter what plans I may have, no matter how skilled of a leader I am, no matter what, how, 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 how great at, at convincing the king I might be, no matter what kind of cloud I have, no matter what, and he just said, if I don't bring this to the God who can change this, nothing else will matter. This will be for naught. And he allowed God to do something in him so that God could do something through him. So today, as we sing this next song, it's just talking about being an open vessel. I want, you to, I want you to stand in this moment. But I want you to stay in a spirit of prayer and just ask yourself some of those questions. Let the Holy Spirit speak to you. And then we'll come back and, and conclude shortly after. Pull me closer, close to your heart. I be a pure reflection of all you are. Love that is patient, a love that is kind, a love that leaves no affections or wrongs in mind. Make me like Jesus, make me like Jesus. 